Hey, what's up guys and gals? It's to be your old buddy Mr. Moose back with another edition of Air Hauler 2. It's the quest to build a Moose Air into a thriving air transportation company. And um, I do say air transportation now instead of saying air cargo because I don't want to pigeonhole this game as an air cargo uh, game because it is so much more. Um, not only can you do air cargo, but you can also do passenger service. Uh, and in passenger service, you can do the big airliner or you can just keep it down to like maybe you want to do a VIP uh, executive air travel with a smaller, more luxurious little uh, turbo prop or Learjet or something like that. Um, maybe you want to do, um, you know, uh, guided tours or charter services, you know, like you're you're taking hunters to their hunting cabin or something else like that you can do all that in this game and that's what's really cool about it you can even down the road do smuggling runs air taxi service i mean there's really some cool things that are planned for this game and uh, so i don't want to mislead you guys into thinking it's just about doing cargo service whereas air hauler one was just air air cargo air hauler two uh, is much more encompassing and pretty much covers I think every aspect of the airliner industry. So um, just make sure I clear that up with you guys. Uh, a couple of things I've learned too um, about the game I'm going to cover in this video. I will say this right off the bat. This video is going to be a little bit long uh, and it's going to be this flight is going to end up being a two parter because I know it because of what I'm getting ready to do. Uh, I want to spend a little bit of time at the beginning of this video explaining Air Hauler the game. And then towards the end, we'll actually do some flying. So I want to clarify that with you guys. So uh, if you're one of these people who's just here to see the flying, you're probably going to want to fast forward through the video. If you're one of these people who's really into the game, you're going to want to pay attention at the beginning because I'm going to give you some information about things I've learned about the game so you don't make the same mistakes I do. So just want to clear that up in the beginning. With all that said, uh, when we last left off, uh, I was in Meridian, Meridian, Mississippi, and I flew back down to the Gulf Coast with a load of like cosmetics, and we made some money, and we were happy, 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 joy, joy, right? Uh, since then, I went on a little tear spree, and uh, I made some runs. I made like a little run over here um, to, actually, I think I made a road to Monroeville uh, with some animal feed made like five grand then i flew over here and picked up some more animal feed and flew it back here for five grand then i really went crazy and i flew from here uh, i had a load going from uh, my home base up here into somewhere around greenwood mississippi and i thought okay well i'm gonna run that up there it's like 400 pounds of automotive parts well at the same time i had a hundred pounds of narcotics leaving monroeville and flying up here to this m65 so i was like hmm what do i want to do so i left here i flew up to monroeville i picked up the narcotics in monroeville so i had two loads on i flew up here to greenwood i dropped off my load there and while i was there found that they had a seven thousand five hundred dollar load of cleaning supplies that needed to go to memphis to mike zero one right next to the memphis international airport uh, that was too much for me to carry at the time, so I split the load in half. I flew from Greenwood to Mike 65, dropped off my 100 pounds of narcotics. While I was there, found a $5,000 load of beef over here to uh, Mike Sierra 80. So I ended up flying from, but I couldn't load it because I was too overloaded with the cleaning supplies. So what I did was I flew the cleaning supplies to Mike 01. I flew empty back to Mike 65. I flew the beef down to Mike Sierra 80. Then I flew back over here to Greenwood, loaded up the rest of that $7,000 load, flew it back up to Mike 01. And then I was like, well, how am I getting out of here? All the loads out of here were dirt cheap. There was nothing really good. But down here at Jackson at 3, Mike Sierra 3, I found. Uh, two loads of, uh, and I don't even think that's the airport it was at, but it was right outside of Jackson. I found two loads 
uh, totaling about $8,000 that were headed back to my home base. And I flew that. So basically all that is to say in three days, I've accumulated a little over $31,000, uh, for the company. So I'm pretty happy. We're sitting at $155,880 and 56 cents. If you look at the ledger, you can see all the little landings I did as well as all the deliveries I did that uh, came together to to do that. And again, they're on the 29th, 30th, and then the 1st uh, is when I did the load late last night. Well, actually, it ended up being 7,420. This was a fun flight. I should have recorded it because I left out of Memphis. Uh, I left out of Jackson, Mississippi uh, after the live stream last night. And, and so it took me two hours. I flew it from like, uh, midnight till 1:45 in the morning. And I actually did the night landing, um, at my home airport on ILS. It was pretty fun. And, uh, I probably should have recorded that, but I didn't. And, uh, Oh, well, but anyways, our company's doing pretty good. As you can see, my reputation is growing. I now have 32 points in my cargo reputation. I have gotten my PPL license as well as my PPL and my instrument, uh, rating. So, um, doing good with it. The problem is, um, my overall reputation grows very slowly doing cargo runs. Uh, for every cargo run, you get one point in reputation and you get three tenths of a point in your overall reputation. Why does that matter? Well, here's the deal. And this is uh, some information I want to pass along to you. If you think about playing this game, you want to be really considerate of how you start the game. Remember, there's easy, medium, hard, career mode. Do not start in career mode unless you are just absolutely a glutton for punishment. And I'm going to say that again. Unless you have a screw loose, you've been kicked by a horse in the head, or you just like to suffer for some reason, do not start in career mode. Do not follow the same path as the moose or short circuit or anyone else who has made the decision to go in career mode. It's a bad decision. You're going down a deep and dark path if you do it. Start in hard mode or something easier because grinding out the reputation to get to 40% is going to take forever. And you cannot basically do anything except grind until you get to 40%. Can't hire or can't hire an AI pilot can't take out a loan and you can't lease an aircraft until you get your reputation up to 40%. So don't do, don't do career mode. Don't do career mode unless you want to play this game every day and you are just a glutton for punishment because it is a long, long, painful road to hoe. Um, if you do it. Yeah. So I'm either going to have to take a ton of cargo flights or I'm going to have to start doing some passenger service as well uh, to get my reputation up. And passenger service, I got to tell you, in a GA aircraft from reading the forums is not fun because you're, you know, GA aircraft, they dance. They're, they're not the most stable planes in the world. And from what I've read, the customer ratings uh, when you do the passenger service in a GA, it's really hard to gain reputation uh, in a GA aircraft doing passenger service because the turbulence and things like that will just eat you alive in, in reputation. So Moosey's going to keep grinding cargo and doing a lot of cargo uh, until I can get up to bigger aircraft to start doing passenger services and stuff. So, uh, But I just want to pass that along to you. Uh, where am I headed with this company? I am trying to buy a new aircraft. Uh, I love the the Cessna. I'm, I'm having a blast flying it, but I need something that will cover more distance and cover it faster. My original plan was to get a Mooney Bravo. I was going to get the Mooney Bravo with the Garmin 1000 full digital suite, you know, and uh, fly it. There was one up here on the used aircraft board. Uh, for like $151,000. And of course, what you know now that I have the $151,000 to purchase it, it is no longer available. But that's actually a good thing because in the meantime, I uh, did some research, did some looking around, and I came across uh, a plane that I really, really want now. And that is the A2A 
um, Comanche, the Piper Comanche. Uh, A2A has done an incredible job on that aircraft. I went and purchased it uh, from their website. I've imported into the game, so now I have the Comanche ready, loaded to go. It's two hundred and six thousand dollars for me to purchase it in the game, uh, so I'm about you know fifty thousand dollars short of that goal uh, to purchase it new. But I went ahead and loaded it into the game yesterday, hoping that uh, within the next 24, 48 hours, maybe one would come up used on the uh, on the previously owned market, and I could get, maybe pick it up for $150,000 somewhere in there. So uh, that's my goal. A couple of more things that I've learned uh, in playing the game and messing around with a test account to see what you could do and what you can't do in the game. Uh, when it comes to purchasing secondhand aircraft, the aircraft you can see is located throughout the, the country as well as throughout the world. Uh, if we even jump over here, you'll see that there's some aircraft over uh, in France uh, and in over in Denmark. So that aircraft, when you purchase it, you purchase it where it sits. And then you can either have it delivered or you can pick it up. Um, which, if it's in the U.S. and everything, like if I was going to purchase this Beach Baron uh, for what is it, $328,000, which is a pretty good deal, um, I would have to either go over there and get it or I would have to have it delivered to my base. Now, if I go get it, I can take possession of it immediately and start flying jobs across the country to get it back to my base. Whereas if I have it delivered, I have to wait on someone else to fly it to me. Um, and that can be... 24, 36 hours, depends on how long it takes them to get it to you. So keep that in mind. There's no charge for the delivery, uh, which that was something I had a question about. And I went and purchased one just to see on my test account. And there is no delivery charge, but you do have to wait out the time uh, for somebody to deliver it to you. So keep that in mind. Uh, what else? Uh, on the aircraft market now, again, I found out that a lease, you can't do a lease until you get to 40% um, in reputation. That's no fun. Uh, but then when you start looking at the lease itself as well, I, my big thing I want to lease is uh, uh, my Coronado uh, PC-12. Um, I don't have the $1.4 to buy it outright. But I thought, well, I'm going to lease one, you know. I'm just going to lease one as soon as I get up $178,000. Oh, hold on. It's not just $178,000 to lease it. That $170,000 is the initial down payment to lease the aircraft. On top of the $178,000 to lease this aircraft, there's a monthly fee you have to pay as well. And the monthly fee on it is a percentage of what that down payment is. And mine was, for this aircraft, $78,000. So uh, in order for me to get into this as a lease, I've got to have at least two hundred and what $256,000 uh, just before I can even get into this aircraft and take it for a flight. So, um, or actually it's $246,000, right? So... No, $256,000. I got that right. $256,000 before I can even get into this plane. So uh, just keep that in mind when you're looking at the lease. It's not this number you're paying. It's this number plus a monthly fee that you have to pay. Plus, I think if you lease it, you probably have to take out insurance on it as well. So there's that fee. So just keep that in mind. While I know I can get bigger and better loads with that one, on top of what my monthly expenses are, I have to be flying, um, you know, if uh, finances, financial overview, I'd have to tack on that $78,000 to my already $13,000 in expenses, which means I've got to make at least eighty, ninety thousand dollars $90,000 a month just to, to break even. So, Wow. Keep all that in mind when you're playing the game. So anyways, uh, that is where we are at right now. That gives you the overview. That gives you some information about the game uh, that you might not know and you might have questions about. And um, yeah, so let's get into hauling some cargo because that's what we're here for. Looking at the big map today, I looked at some jobs and was trying to find something of interest to fly. Um, and... 
This one right here stuck out real quick. Anytime narcotics comes up on the board, you know you're going to make some money. $5,000 to haul 100 pounds of, of narcotics over to one Gulf Alpha 8. Seems like a winner there, but I mean, it's only 100 pounds. So what else can I throw on the plane? So since this is the route going out to one Gulf Alpha 8, I looked around and checked out some other routes that were in the general area. And I found... This route here, 5 Alpha Lima 8 going to 09 Gulf Alpha, and it is hauling DVDs. 366 pounds of DVDs for $3,294. That means this route here that was only going to make $5,000 is actually going to end up making me about $8,294. Granted, I've got to deviate just so slightly to drop down, pick up that load, and then I've got to drop it off and everything over here. But for about the same amount of distance that I was going to cover to make $5,000, I can now make $8,294. So that seems like a winner to me, and that is what we are going to do today. So... Uh, you'll see that I've already accepted the jobs. I've already got them listed. I've actually already got them, uh, the narcotics loaded on the aircraft. And so we're good to go. We'll hit fly now. We'll come over here and we'll select our Cessna. And you can see I've already loaded the narcotics onto the plane. I've also put some fuel in here. I've got 236 pounds of fuel on the plane. That gives me an estimated range of 377 nautical miles. Uh, our distance to one Gulf Alpha 8 is 235 miles. I will be deviating my course slightly, but not that much, about 30 nautical miles. So I've basically have put enough fuel on the plane to cover the distance we're going to travel plus 100 nautical miles uh, just to give me a cushion. Uh, we'll pick up the DVDs. That's also the other thing I have to look at is I've got 336 on board in weight. I need have at least 366 available to put throw the DVDs on. I'm well under that, so I've got 564 uh, pounds of available cargo space. So we're good to go. So at this point, everything looks good. I'll hit OK. It's going to bring up my flight planner. Again, I don't do my flight plan in... Um, in air hauler you're more than welcome to uh you could fly direct you could do vors you could do whatever you wanted to you could plan out uh your flight plan here in air hauler i don't do it that way i use the in-game planner some people use a third party program uh to go in and do their their flight plans and then just import them into flight sim however you want to do it you can do it the only thing that i've gotten into a habit of doing is coming over here and making sure i switch to vfr instead of doing IFR because there will be times when I'm going to fly. And like in this case, when we're over here in Georgia and I'm at uh, zero Gulf or whatever it is, eight, and I've got to fly 50 miles to the next air, air airport, I'm not going to follow the flight plan. I'm just going to do a, a, you know, a VFR flight and ask for the air for flight following and just jump it, you know, quick up and down and I'm there. And I do if I come over here and mess with this stuff and I hit IFR, um, it will put me an IFR plan and I have to then ask for IFR clearance. I got to take off. I got to cancel the IFR, then ask for flight following. It's just a, a nightmare to deal with. So I just make sure I go ahead and always specific, uh, set this up VFR, uh, right off the bat. And then that gives me the option of when I get into flight sim, I can either follow an IFR flight plan or I can just do VFR and uh, get going. So, uh, that's that. Uh, so anyways, VFR 8,000 feet. Yeah, that's fine except the route and let's get going i'm going to go ahead and uh this is going to say make sure you start up flight sim once it's started up and you've loaded everything in then hit the ok button that's fine um my flight sim is already up and running the aircraft is sitting on the runway and that is where i will meet you guys next and we'll get flying all right, guys and gals, welcome back to Jack Edwards Airfield, and here is our Cessna C-172 sitting on the ground. It is a sunny, beautiful day. We're going to have a great flight, but first, we've got some procedures to go through. 
Uh, the plane is sitting in its cold and dark state, strapped down from uh, where it was last uh, brought in. And we do need to walk around, inspect the plane, do all that good stuff. I am going to go through procedures a little bit more in depth. Someone was saying the other day that I really should not skip any procedures or, or uh, you know, actually showcase the procedures a little bit more because they watch to try to learn. Uh, so I am going to do that and do a little bit job. And that's the reason I say these videos are going to be a bit longer and broken into segments because I know I can't get it all covered in an hour, let alone 30 minutes at a time. Somebody's saying, you need to do 30 minute videos. There's no way. There's absolutely no way. So anyways, we are going to cover procedures and uh, go a little bit more in depth. And I will say Say procedures are very important on this plane especially if you're using an a2a plane or any sort of third-party uh, aircraft that is modeled to um, to really be a, a simulation um, you really need to do your procedures because this particular plane um, it will break uh, there is a lot of stuff on it that will break you'll get water in the fuel if you don't follow your procedures and you walk around you're gonna be in trouble so little things that you may not think about if you play with stock aircraft in flight sim, if you're playing with an A2A plane or something else, you need to follow your procedures because you might find a little something there that um, isn't necessarily right and it could cause you a lot of problems. So we are going to go through the procedures and I'll explain why I'm saying that as we go along. But we're going to jump into the cockpit and uh, we'll go ahead and begin our procedures by jumping into our pilots uh, into our pre-flight menu. And uh, before I've just done the pre-flight and not recorded it, but I'm going to record it and actually walk you through it, show you what to do and why you're doing the things that you're doing. Because um, while I looked at this originally when I bought this plane and thought, well, that's cool. That's great. You can simulate the pre-flight check. And I just kind of hem hawed through it the first time. As I've flown this plane more and more and more, I've come to realize this is really, really important because they've simulated a lot of stuff in here that I really didn't think they had simulated so it's very important that you not skip through all this stuff so uh, we'll begin by taking our pito tube cover off now i can do that either by jumping in to shift three and taking it off here or i can actually jump out and and take it off by jumping over here and doing it uh, so I'm going to jump back in. Pito tube cover is off. Uh, pilot's operating handbook. Make sure it's in the plane. It is right down here next to the door. Uh, so that is in place. Uh, then we come in to weight and balance. I want to check, make sure our weights are right. Now my pilot is sitting in the plane at 170. I do need to load my cargo in. My cargo is going to be represented by this guy uh, with the flat top. He's going to be 100 pounds, which that does not look like a dude that was 100 pounds, but... Okay, anyways, for uh, this load, that's what's there. And then we have 232 pounds of fuel that are in our, our wings. You want to check that you got 19 gallons on this side. I got 20 gallons on this side. I probably ought to switch that. Let's put that there and put that there. That'll give a little bit more weight on uh, that side of the plane versus this side of the plane. It just kind of counter offset me being more than my, uh, my 100 pounds of narcotics that's sitting on the front seat next to me. Uh, so yeah, right in plain sight for the DEA. Uh, but anyways, uh, let's go ahead and continue on. Uh, parking brake set. We need to make sure that it is set. So there we go. Uh, control wheel lock is off. Let's go ahead and get rid of that. Uh, that just keeps it so you, the wheel can't move or anything else like that. That is taken off. Ignition switch is off. Our avionics master switch is off. Our battery master switch needs to come to the on position. And we are going to turn on the pito heat and start heating up our pito. And uh, the reason we want to do that now is we're going to check it in a few minutes to make sure that it's warm and uh, verify that because we don't want to get up in the air and find out that it's not it's not working uh, if we were flying into icing conditions. So I want to do that. Fuel quantity, check. We Our gauges are showing that we've got 20 and 19 over here. Avionics field gauges are notoriously wrong. Um, so we will also verify that in our pre-flight inspection when we walk around and check them uh, in the wings. So avionics master switch is turned on. That's going to turn on our radios. We go ahead and get those fired up, make sure that everything's working. 
Uh, then we'll go static pressure off. That is this right here. Uh, enunciator test panel switch. We want to push that all the way up. And that will get all our lights fired up. We'll release it. And what we want to do is make sure all the lights blink and then that these bottom rows stay on because those are our lights for oil pressure, vacuum, and voltage. And we want all that to line up and uh, stay on because those shouldn't go off until the engine starts. And that is check. Uh, so that is good. Fuel selector switch needs to be both and we need to turn our full shutoff valve on. So that needs to go to both and that needs to be pushed in so that is on. That is good. That takes care of these two. Flaps needs to be fully extended so that we can see that they will extend. And we'll come out here and just check. You see those going down right now. Excellent. Excellent. That looks good. Uh, what else do we need to do? We need to uh, go ahead and turn our pilot's pitot heat off. Turn that pitot heat off. Avionics master switch now needs to be turned off and the battery needs to be turned off. There we go. And elevator trim needs to be set to take off position. That is checked. That is this wheel right here. And that is good. Now we can step outside the plane and we'll actually start doing our walk around. Uh, first thing we're going to do is we're going to check our pitot. Now that it's been heated up, we'll just check it with our finger. It is warm to the touch. That means it is good to go. Uh, if it were cold, we would know that we had some sort of problem. If it was a blue circle, it would be cold. And we know we had a, uh, some sort of problem with the heat on it. We need to take it in the maintenance hangar and work on it because you want that. If you were flying in icing conditions, that needs to be working. Uh, make sure our fuselage is locked up and everything is good to go on the tail section we'll come back here for some reason my straps disappeared when we were doing all that uh, when I took off the wheel lock or wheel lock it got rid of the straps but I had this thing tied down I was going to come through and unstrap it as we walked around check all our linkage here in the back now this is where this is really important that you walk around and you look the other day I came in here and one of my rudder linkage was broken um, you know, and it was one of those situations where I was doing my walk around. I got back here in the back and I had no right rudder and it was because the linkage on the actuator, uh, was actually broken. So I had to take it into the maintenance hangar and actually repair that. So, uh, again, I used to think these, uh, the, this pre-flight check was a joke and it's not, they've actually taken the time to, I, you know, I thought all these pictures are just static. They don't really matter. They're not. They're actually live pictures that adjust according to the condition of the aircraft. And uh, this aircraft, even when you're not flying it, like let's say I flew it today and I don't fly it for another two months, sim it simulates corrosion and fatigue on the aircraft from just sitting. So it's best that you fly it. Otherwise, it will get corrosive and, and you'll have problems. Uh, again, there should be a tie down over here that I would untie. Uh, check the leading edge. Make sure there's no issues on here. Tires, make sure they're inflated. Everything looks good there. Uh, come over here. Now, this is another one. I got in here the other day, and I thought, well, this action is pretty funny. They're showing you what it's like to, to drain fuel out of your, your, your test valve and see that there's any water in here. I thought, well, that's really cool. And then it's got this cute little drain more button down here. And I thought, well, that really doesn't matter. Then the other day, I got in the plane, and I, and I flew a little bit with it. And I did a stop and go. I was doing like a stop and go. I was going to pull in, unload some cargo, reload some cargo, and take off. Well, apparently the game decided that I took a long stop and go, that I actually stayed overnight or whatever, and then I got condensation in the fuel because I tried to start the, the motor back up thinking it was in a warm state and it should fire right on up, right? I did that, and when I did... Uh, it sputtered and just was the roughest thing and just kicked and screamed and it was nasty. Couldn't figure out what was wrong. I thought maybe I'd filed some spark plugs. I uh, checked those. That was fine. Ended up doing a full walk around the aircraft and found out that I had water in the fuel. This whole bottom section was completely translucent and I had to hit the drain more button like five times in order to get that to uh, to fully work. So uh, make sure that you check that when you come around and pay attention to that because that is not, again, I thought it was like a static image and uh, it turns out it's not. It changes based upon the aircraft conditions. Uh, the next thing you do is you check your fuel. And again, I told you that those fuel gauges can be notoriously wrong. 
This again is not a static image. The blue in here adjusts based upon how much fuel you're supposed to have in your wings. So uh, look, here's the 20 mark. That should show 20. On the other one, we should be around 19 on the other one. So uh, we'll go around, we'll check. We'll check our oil. Our oil is uh, kind of getting muddy. We've put some hours on this and we're supposed to change the oil every 25 hours. Uh, or four months we're getting pretty far on this one so we've got some muddy oil uh, we probably need to change our oil pretty soon but we're we're good to go I know we haven't reached 25 hours but we have been stressing the aircraft out quite a bit so uh, we're probably not too far from needing an oil change uh, underneath the nose here we'll change out the uh, check the fuel again make sure that it's not translucent down here on the bottom that you don't have any water in the fuel if you did you'd hit the drain more until any kind of junk was out of the fuel um, and then we're going to come over here check for damage on the nose nothing is damaged here we're good to go check to make sure we don't have any any blockage in our in, in our cooling vents that would restrict our airflow because we don't want to uh, have it overheat on us. Static air, we need to make sure that that is uh, clear and good to go. And that looks good. I've got to click off something there in the corner. Uh, that is, there's no blockage there. That is uh, part of uh, making sure that our uh, altimeters work good. Coming over here, and again, we're checking the fuel level in this. It's a little bit below 20 gallons, which this this wing should be a little bit lower over here. Uh, so we are good to go on that. And then over here, we'll drain this wing, make sure there's there's no fuel, any problem. Inspect the pito cover, or inspect the pito to make sure that it's in good shape. All right. The last thing we want to do is we need to come over here. We need to check our stall opening. Uh, make sure that there's no blockage on that. Make sure there's no blockage on our fuel vent. And make sure we're not tied down. Come around, check this. Check all our linkage. Make sure nothing's blocked. And check this. Make sure everything's good on this side with our flaps. Make sure our linkage is all good. Everything looks good. So we'll jump back into the cab. Our pre-flight inspection is done. So at this point, we can grab our pilot's handbook. We can bring it out, and we can start the actual process of getting our plane ready to roll and get it off the runway. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to close my door. I'm going to get that closed up. There we go. I'm going to turn this floodlight off because it is daytime. I don't need it. All right. So uh, airplane weight and balance, we've checked that already. Our parking brake is set. Our control lock is off. We've already done all of this. We're going to head over to our engine start settings. And we are going to go ahead and begin by cracking the throttle just a little bit. I, I go to about 25% on that and I get it all set up and then I'm good to go. Now I realize that when I mouse over it, you guys don't see some of the stuff that I see. Uh, when I mouse over this, it actually shows me my throttle at 25%. Uh, when I was watching the video back the other day, I realized that my recording software doesn't record those little subtle things that I'm seeing. But when you see me mouse over my throttles, I'm actually seeing the numbers uh, pop up. And it shows me my throttles at 25%. So uh, that is cracked. I want my mixture to be at uh, full idle. So that is all the way back. Uh, I'm going to turn my master switch on. Turn my beacon on, go ahead and get that up. And then this plane is sat, so we're gonna, uh, again, we're assuming that it's in a cold and dark state. So we are going to have to prime the engine. So by doing that, we're gonna turn the fuel pump on and we're going to advance the mixture until we see that fuel pump move. And it says three seconds, I just give it a second or two and then it goes otherwise to run the risk of flooding out the motor. Uh, so that is done, turn that back off. Now with that taken care of, uh, we will turn it off. We'll check the area to make sure that the uh, propeller area is clear, that nobody has walked in front of it and isn't in the area. And technically, I should open up the window and I should yell out the word clear right now and uh, or clear prop and let everybody know that I'm getting ready to start this plane. So to start it up again, I'm just going to advance my key over to both and then yell clear prop and I'll turn it over advance my mixture in and get her running there we 
we go. Bring it up to about a thousand RPMs. Now, one thing with this plane, I've been I, I in learning how to fly this one. I have been following out some spark plugs. And it's because I tend to follow guides and I, I tend to leave my mixture rich when I was sitting on the ground. And I've come to realize I really need to lean that mixture out on ground operations. So when I'm just sitting here and idle, I'm bringing that throttle back to uh, 50, 60% and leaning that mixture out a little bit so there's no fuel lean up. And in real world situations, people really suggest that you do that as well. Uh, that way you don't get fuel build up. You run, the, you lessen the risk of a fi engine fire. So um, yeah, I've come to to really be leaning that out a lot on on ground operations to make sure that everything runs right. All right, so our mixture is good. Our oil pressure, we want to check all of our gauges at this point. Make sure everything is looking good. So we'll zoom in just a little bit so that we can see. Our oil pressure is good. Our vacuum is starting to come up and seal up. So all of our gauges are going to work properly. Our temperature will start to rise. I want that oil temperature to come up a little bit before we do a run up. And uh, so while the engine's cold, we'll keep that, those RPMs down to lessen any stress on the engine. And then we'll go ahead and we'll start getting our nav lights set up. I'll go ahead and turn my strobes and my navs on just so people see me sitting here. I should know I'm here because the motor's on him, but, you know, is what it is. Avionics are on. That's good. Check this. You see our flight plan going out of here. Good to go there. We'll let that motor warm up and uh, we'll get about ready to go. We'll go ahead and retract our flaps now. And we'll move to the next page, which is going to be our before takeoff page. Seat belts and doors are closed. We are good to go on there. Flight controls free and color correct. So let's just check, make sure we've got our ailerons working. Our elevators are good. Rudders, yep, rudders are working good. Everything is uh, good to go. Bring our pilot's book back up. Uh, let's see, flight instruments checked and set. Uh, let's see, we haven't really figured out which way we're taking off. The wind is calm today, so uh, I can take off whichever direction I want to go out of here. Uh, we're going to be flying, probably going to be taking off to the east because that'll be the easiest way to get out of here and then make our turn headed north uh, for where we're, we're going to. So we're traveling east. We're going to take off east. Makes it pretty simple, right? So we'll start off on a heading of uh, 9 zero. We are going to fly VFR over to, um, to our first runway. It's only 100 miles, so it's going to be a VFR flight. Uh, let's see fuel quantity checked Now it says mixture rich. I'm not going to do that until we do the run-up Fuel selector. Yeah, recheck that make sure that that's good. Yep. Nothing has changed All right, we'll do the run-up when we get to the uh, When we get to the runway, I don't like doing it right here in front of the building if the brake were to slip or something like that You go plowing into the building. So that's not good. So let's go ahead and taxi out of here, and we will uh, we'll get going. Check our engine temperature. We're starting to get a little temp in the oil, so that's good. Uh, our exhaust gas temperatures are, are good. Vacuum's coming up. Amps are good. We're in the green everywhere, so we can start uh, getting ready to roll out of here. So we'll go ahead and turn on our ATS and we will contact, we'll check the weather real quick. Hilo, Juliet, Hilo, Alpha, automated like I said, the winds are calm, so we can take off whichever way we want to. Wind is calm, visibility greater than 20 miles. Sky 
Set our altimeter. Set my altimeter over here as well. We're going to run about 5,000 feet on this flight. So I'm going to go ahead and set up for 5,000 feet on the autopilot. I've already got my heading bug set. We'll go ahead and select our runway for takeoff, which is going to be runway 9. And we'll announce our taxi. Alright, I'm going to go ahead and take my brakes off. And when I do, I'm going to roll forward just a little bit. I'm going to tap my brakes again just to verify and check that they're working. That's good. Then I'm going to hit for pushback. And I'll get pushback going. And we'll start to get set up for this flight out of here. All right. So this video will probably be the setup, takeoff, and then we'll come back and do the rest of the, in the next video, we'll do landings and stuff like that. Um, so I'm hitting the one button to go ahead and get the back end to kick around to the left. Now that's just one on your keyboard. Very cool. All right, so I'll cancel pushback and we should start to creep forward. Put a little right rudder in there and we'll start our roll uh, around here and head over to runway niner back up just a little bit on screen so I can see what I'm doing I want to watch my RPMs I don't want the plane to run away from me while I'm taxiing it runs a little rough because I've got that thing leaned out so much Make this turn. Come on. There we go. Get back online. Probably should give it just a little bit more. There we go. We're going to make this turn here. And then we'll set up for our run up a little hot coming in there I'm still my my uh, my taxi stuff is not the best in the world all right so we'll go ahead and set our parking brake and we're gonna advance our mixture to full rich let's bring this up scale down a little bit here so we can see what's going on and we'll do our run-up procedures. Again, we're going up to uh, 8,000 RPMs on this. There we go. And the first thing I want to do is check my vacuums, my temperature, all of that. Make sure everything is real good. All right. Then I'm going to check uh, here to see that I've got everything is right on my magnetos. I want to switch over to my magnetos and see that I get that 50 drop. There's the drop on that one on the left. Run it back up. 50 drop on the right. So that is good. And we'll bring that back down to idle. So the one thing I forgot to do was turn my taxi light on. I will turn my landing lights on this time, make sure that that is good to go. And we will go ahead and we will do our uh, pre takeoff, before takeoff. And we're going to go ahead and set our flaps to one quarter. I've already set my elevator trim, so that is good. Radio lights are set. I'm doing that a little out of order. So throttle idle set for a thousand RPMs, that's what I did. I've got my fuel mixture advanced to full rich. Radio and lights are set. Elevator trim is set for takeoff. 
and I've got my wind flap set for uh, one quarter or 10 degrees. If I was on a really short runway, I might take that down to, to uh, a second notch and do uh, you know half flaps and or three quarter flaps and uh, run that with uh, a little bit more. Uh, but I don't need it because this is plenty of runway uh, for this little bit of a plane. All right, so we'll go to take off again. Flaps are set. Mixture is rich. Uh, throttle. We're going to advance slowly to full open. Uh, then, yeah, rotate at 55 knots, climbing speed 70 to 80. And then once we have positive air, air uh, climb, we'll go ahead and uh, re retract our flaps. So we'll go ahead and turn up ATC. Let me get rid of that out of here. Turn up ATC. We'll go ahead and announce uh, that we're going straight out on runway 9. Zero. All right, brakes off. That's going to roll us on out here. And I'm not really going to slow up. I'm just going to basically straighten myself up. Once everything looks good, I'll go ahead and advance the power and we'll get her up in the air. I do want to go ahead and close my window real quick. Alright. I'm using the hack control on my joystick, but I am going to flip over to track IR in a minute. Alright, let's go. My track R was dead when I started recording. Alright, so she lifted off early. So we'll just keep her nose down a little bit so we can build up some airspeed. Alright, 70, 80 knots. I'm going to go ahead and pull back on the, uh, on the flaps. Good to go. She is building some airspeed, so we'll go ahead and climb a little bit. And just let her climb. And again, I said we're going to end up you know, at 5,000 feet. I'm going to start trimming her out for about, you know, we don't have a whole lot of weight in here. So I can trim her out pretty, pretty positive rate of climb. So like if uh, maybe around, if I can maintain like 80 knots of airspeed on it uh, that would be pretty good and do about you know a thousand feet per minute I'm a little past on my trim I bought a new yoke or I bought a used yoke and there's a little bit of a catch in the very middle of it because uh, the person had broken it a little bit and so there it's a little bit finicky on getting trimmed out but we're trimmed out right there at uh, 90 knots. Airspeed's coming down a little bit, but we're climbing at 1,000 feet per minute, which is pretty good. We'll go ahead and contact ATC, ask for flight following. Uh, I don't want the nearest airport. There we go. Sherman departure. Request flight following. Alright, so let's acknowledge their squawk code, which is going to set our transponder over here. I'm drifting a little bit to the east, but that's a, or, or to the north, that's fine. Let me acknowledge the radar contact, and then we'll be good to go. We can uh, just fly our own thing, and we'll start making our way over here to what is our GPS course and then when we get close to it we'll start 
uh, locking on and navigating using our GPS. So I'm just giving it a little slight pressure to rotate that way. I'm still watching my rate of climb and um, I'm good. We're about climbing at about 800 feet per minute right now and maintaining our airspeed around uh, 87 knots, which is fine. I mean, the book says like 75, 80 knots, 70 to 80 knots, um, but usually I end up climbing a little bit faster than that. I don't like really pushing a, a thousand feet per, or per minute in this plane. And normally I can't because I'm normally so loaded down in it that I can't do that type of uh, climb. So at this point too, I can go ahead and turn my landing lights off. Uh, general aviation aircraft, you don't have to have your landing lights on uh, once you get off the ground and away from the airport. Uh, a lot of people will fly with them sometimes on because you know more visibility is a good thing, but uh, you don't have to have them on the whole time. Most pilots will tell you to turn them off as soon as you get off, uh, you know, and up and going. On takeoff and approach, that's about it. Now, somebody, I just opened my uh, myself up for somebody to jump in and go, "Oh no, you're wrong on that one. You should have that up." My 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 teacher told me to keep them on the entire time. All right, so zoom out a little bit on our GPS see where our lines at I'm gonna go ahead and switch my nav over to GPS so when I throw this on the autopilot uh, I can go ahead and uh, catch it up now I could fly this stick the whole time but I'm probably gonna throw it on the autopilot it just it's a little bit easier all right coming up on 4,000 I'm gonna start trimming the nose down a little bit slowing my climb up a little bit just makes it a little bit easier for me to uh, go ahead and control the plane instead of trying to do it all right when I hit 5,000 feet. Alright, there's our course coming up, so I'm just going to start putting my course back around. Watching my elevation here. Really, I can start feathering my my throttle back a little bit as well. That'll slow up my my rate of climb as well, and then I can re trim for that speed. Looking pretty good. I still need to bring the bring around, get on course. Alright, acknowledge that handoff. There we go. Bring back my power a little bit here. Turn my nose down just a little bit. Come on. Stop climbing. Alright, tune to Pensacola Approach. Contact Pensacola Approach. Alright, we're going to start leaning out our mixture as well. Backing that off a little bit. And we don't need to use as much power now. And I'll back that throttle back down even more. I want to cruise at about 100 knots. We're leveled up. We're just over 5,000 feet. We're pretty good. I can just put a little forward pressure on the yoke. Bring that nose down to 5,000.
and get her all trimmed up. Our course is looking pretty good. We're in pretty good shape right now. Nice. All right. So at this point, I'm trimmed up 5,000 feet. We're uh, looking at our course here on our GPS. We're just a little bit south of it or just a little bit off of it. I can just give it a little slight pressure to the left and just slowly rotate that direction. Not putting too much into it. Looking at our flight plan, these are our intersections we're going to go through. We got 87 nautical miles to fly to get there. This is going to take a little bit. So what we'll do is we'll call this an episode. Uh, now that we're up here, I will probably throw this onto the autopilot, let it roll itself on over there because there's really no course directions to take. These are just intersections that we're going to hit along the way. Uh, and then uh, when we start up our next video, we'll be getting ready to land. And... Um, we'll go from there so we'll go ahead we're gonna arm the autopilot go ahead and set that up for 5,000 feet there we go that's good and heading wise I'm gonna kick it over to navigation mode which I have set for the GPS it's gonna walk us over to the actual line that the GPS is tracking and we're good to go and at this point guys I will say thank you for watching hope you enjoy the video I'll leave you a couple of scenic views and we'll come back and I'll catch you in the next episode we'll land at our next airport we'll load up with some more uh, goodies take off we'll do a turn and burn and uh, we'll get to our destination and we'll make our deliveries in our next video so thanks for watching hope you've enjoyed it remember to like comment subscribe and I will see you in our next air hauler video. Thanks for watching. Have a great day. Bye bye. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's video. And if you did, I hope you consider giving it a like, maybe even sharing it with your friends. It does help me out a tremendous amount and is greatly appreciated. Also, leave some comments down below. That's really the only way I can gauge if you guys are enjoying what's being put out. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you want daily notifications. I try to do a new video each and every day. Also, if you want to stay in touch with me and find out what's going on, our social links are down in the bottom left-hand corner. Twitter is where I usually announce schedule changes, live streams, and new video releases. Facebook's a great way to get in touch with me if you have any questions to ask. And, of course, I am trying to get to 1,000 followers on Google+, Plus, which I know I'll probably be old and gray before that happens. But if you can jump over there and follow me, it would be super awesome. So if you like today's video, there's a whole lot more content on the channel. I hope you'll browse through it, find something to keep yourself entertained until the next video or live stream. Speaking of live streams, I try to do them nightly around 6 p.m. Central Standard Time. Until the next time, thanks again for watching. See you soon.